All right, Front Row Dads, welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to be focusing on marriage and who else and whatever else comes up on the show. But my guest today is Mort Fertel, and uh, we're going to dig into marriage with this man in just a moment. Uh, and I'm grateful that he's on the show. If you're new to this podcast, this is the show for family men with businesses, not businessmen who happen to have families. And we are a group that focuses on uh, you know, parenting strategies and work-life balance, or we call it integration. We talk about marriage. We talk about health. We talk about uh, all sorts of things that relate to family life. And if you've just found the show, I'm glad you're here. And if you're back for more, uh, we've got a great guest for you today. Mort, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let's first start off with some easy stuff. Where are, are you today? I never bothered to ask. Where, is, where are you calling in from? I'm in my office in Baltimore. Okay, cool, man. Is that where you grew up? No, I grew up in Philadelphia, but we've lived here for about 15 years. Nice, man. I, we, my wife and I spent 13 years in South Jersey, and I love Philly. Uh, when did you leave? When, how long were you in Philly? I was in Philly. I was born in Philly. I was raised in Philly. I went to Ka, went to Penn, New York, Penn State. Oh, nice. Went to school business. And, um, and then I went to New York after I graduated. That's great, man. You went to Wharton. Yeah, I went to Wharton. That's awesome. My buddy, Earl Kelly, you guys might be around the same age. He also went to Wharton. Um, good dude from the local area. Lots of good memories from Philly. What do you miss about that area? Well, I'm not far from there and I still have family there. So I, you know, return periodically. I love Philly. I love South Philly, um, uh, you know, the South the Shore. Uh, right. My parents have a place in Margate, New Jersey, and I go there periodically. And and uh, what do I love about it? Running up the uh, art museum stairs. <laughs> There's a, there's a great restaurant near Old City. It might be in Old City, actually, but it's called High Street on Market. Have you ever been there? No. Oh, man. When you go back, please go eat at High Street on Market. It's like, for me, one of my favorite uh, restaurant experiences in the city. My, it's one of the things I miss about Philly was the food. It's just such a cool area. Yeah. So that's wonderful, man. Well, more tell... Uh, tell us what it is that you do today, because I recognize that bios can be big and there's lots of avenues. But as of this morning, when you woke up, what is it that you're focused on? So I, um, I work with couples in marital crisis mm. and I help them save their marriage. Yeah. Uh, I created a methodology called marriage fitness that I use to help them achieve that. And I do private phone sessions, full day intensives, and primarily most people join the Marriage Fitness Teleboot Camp, which is a whole, you know, a whole program designed to help people walk, walk them through the steps of saving and reconciling their marriage. Yeah. And um, how, how, I'm trying to think about what's the next question there, because I'm curious about the success rate. You know, or like what the intention is when somebody goes, is it, hey, you know, your, your thought is, hey, I'm not trying to save every marriage. In fact, sometimes marriages might need to dissolve. Like maybe somebody comes to you and to help figure out they shouldn't be married. Do you believe that? Or do you, do you feel like every marriage should be saved? So in theory, I believe that there is a time and a place for people to get divorced. I don't think that people are responsible for being martyrs and for staying in a miserable marriage for their whole life. I'm not a marriage at all cost kind of guy. There mm -hmm. is and can be a time and a place for divorce. That's in theory. In practice, I have met very, very, very few people who have actually conducted themselves in what I consider to be a responsible way during the course of the marriage such that they earn the right to exit with a clear conscience. Mm. In other words, most people who are looking to exit their marriage have not done what they should do before they take that path. They haven't yeah. tried what they should try. They haven't worked on their fixing. They haven't taken responsibility, whatever. There's a whole sort of checklist of things that I think a person should do before they call it quits. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a toaster oven. It's not something we just, you know, dispose of or return because, you know, because it's, uh, it's not working. Um, it's something that really warrants significant time, effort, and energy. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what I do is teach and preach that message, which is you're not happy. Okay, that's not unusual. Let's talk about what you should do now that you're not happy before you exit. Yeah. On your homepage of your website, you uh, say there's, there's a few reasons 
why somebody would jump in, right? Because you'll learn, and then here I'm going to read off some of the bullets, why marriage counseling fails, how to deal with I don't love you, how to forgive and be forgiven, how to reconnect with your spouse, how to get your spouse to change, how to rebuild broken trust, how to get over the past, how to avoid a separation, how to ruin their affair. <laughs> I laughed at that one. And plus five marriage assessments. Now, I've got to tell you, I see a lot of sites and that one really was like one of the most compelling reasons to click that button and say yes. Like those are, those are really powerful statements. Now, I'm curious if you actually, do you know which one or two of those gets people to click that button more than anything else? I don't know. Yeah. What would you guess? What do you think all, is the most with all your work? They're all, they're all uh, different ones are compelling for different people depending on their situation. Yeah. It's uh, not like one wins out over all relationships. Right. Some right. people are hearing from their spouse, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Uh, other people are dealing with infidelity. Of course, when you're dealing with infidelity, you're also wondering how to rebuild trust. So some of the some of them are sort of related to each other, also. Yep. Um, but they're 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 all pretty compelling, depending on one's situation. What what is um what is the percentage of couples that get uh, that cheat? What what are the percentages from men to women and women to men? It's very hard to answer the question because um, surveys have been taken, but of course everybody lies. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because uh, the cheaters don't answer the survey correctly, right? But, but the people that have done the research, trying to factor in the number of people that they think lie, estimate that between 30 and 50% of men at some point in their marriage will become adulterers and probably 20 to 40% of women. Okay. And tell me um, what constitutes cheating in your mind or in the minds of maybe the people that you're working with? And I think this is like a legit question when it comes to being in a marriage is like, is flirting cheating? Is sending a cute ex is, or maybe it's like, maybe that's just to be determined by the couple. So that's a brilliant question because it's obvious that if you sleep with somebody, if you're physically intimate with somebody, that that's a total betrayal. And that's right. Cheating. But, um, but I believe that that you don't have to sleep with somebody to be unfaithful. There's such a thing as emotional infidelity. If I'm sharing with somebody in a private, you know, coffee or drink setting, the deepest hopes and dreams or fears of my life, that's very intimate. Yeah. And that should be very private between my wife and I. And that would be a complete betrayal. And I would consider that unfaithful. Mm-hmm. It is, um, is porn an issue? It's gotta be. It's huge. It's yeah. It's absolutely a terrible issue. What, 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 what's your take on that? What's your thought on that for, you know, as it affects a marriage, right? Cause some guys could be like, well, I'm just looking at porn, right? It's not hurting anybody. I'm not physically cheating. And I think there's a lot of easy justifications around that. I mean, I don't even know the stats on porn, but it's gotta be huge. Yeah. I mean, you've seen the, I've seen the Google search stats on porn. <laughs> know the industry it's massive what's your take on that huge problem you know it used to be that if you wanted to watch porn it had to bear the consequences the embarrassment of going downtown buying a ticket showing yourself in public walking out of a place where you might be seen so you know the number of the percentage of people that were willing to take that risk was very small you know, today there's no risk of humiliation right you know? There's no risk of embarrassment. Well, there is a little bit, right? But it's not enough to get people to stop. The risk of like one day your internet browsing history being opened up to the world. Like somebody's going to hack it and basically say, do you want to see anybody's lifetime browser history? Here it is. Right. So, right. You know. right. So I shouldn't, right, you're right. There's, not that there's no risk, but it's dramatic. It's very different. Less. Yeah, it's, it's a whole different, different ball game. You know, you don't have a Playboy subscription showing up in yeah. your front door, you know. Uh, you really have total privacy. So as a result, it's become a gigantic problem. Yeah. And what's my, and for anybody who justifies that, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, ask your wife if she thinks it's a big deal. <laughs> you know? It's a good, it's a good point because I mean, would you say that if the wife says it's not a big deal, like, yeah, go ahead. Like enjoy then. I would not, no, I would not say that, but, but no, 
but ask your wife because most wives, you know, would be upset and feel betrayed. Right. Even if they wouldn't, what I try to explain to people is worse than you're hurting your wife and your marriage is you're hurting yourself. When you expose yourself to that kind of imagery, the damage it does to your dignity and to your soul is worse than any damage it does to your wife and your marriage. Mm. And so the most important reason to refrain from such disgusting behavior is to protect and maintain your own character and dignity. Yeah. Not to mention the impact that it has on you know, your wife and your marriage. And by the way, for those who say, oh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't affect my marriage, you have to appreciate there is a direct correlation between exclusivity and intimacy. Right. Meaning the more exclusive something is, the more intimate it is. So for example, if you and I are buddies when we're nine years old and after school, we go into the forest and we build a little tree house and we bring box games and we play, you know, tag. So as long as it's just the two of us sharing that, it'll be a very special experience. Yep. As soon as one of us goes to school and brings all the other friends to this private tree house, I've now, it's true, I will now have shared this with other people, but I will have diluted the power and the specialness and the uniqueness of that experience between you and I. Yep. So that's one of the consequences to using pornography is something that should be exclusive and unique and special and therefore intimate just between my wife and I becomes something that is not special, not unique, not exclusive, and therefore not nearly as intimate. So you're robbing yourself of the intimacy and the power of the sexual experience you could be experiencing with your wife. Yeah, good points. Do you, what do you think about husbands and wives who choose to watch it together? It, social contract does not determine the truth. Right. It doesn't matter if we agree to do something. If what we're agreeing to do is damaging, it will be just as damaging. Hmm. So wh what's damaging about it in your mind? So I just explained. Uh, there, is a, there, there is a correlation between exclusivity and intimacy. Oh, it still applies there. See, I didn't make that connection. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course you're, you're bringing other people, even though they're images on a screen, nonetheless, you're bringing other people into an experience that's designed to be exclusive and intimate. Got it. And do you, so can I take a stab at the fact that you don't believe in polyamory? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. I mean, I, I don't know. It's like, you, you know, like you said, I'm not going to toss you all the questions you get a million times a week. Yeah. So oh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some tough ones here, Mort. I'm not going to go easy on you. So, um, all right. So fair enough. Let, let's talk about some of these, these bullet points that you've shared because they really did get my attention. Um, so now how to get your spouse to change. Do we really get our spouse to change or is that sort of speaking to the language of what somebody's feeling when they come to your website? Because I get like I've said, how do I get my spouse? How do I get my wife to change? But then I recognize that when I process that, I'm not going to get her to change. I'm going to change me. What, who, who's changing in the situation? Right. So it, it's, you know, people always say that, you know, I can only change me. And usually when they say that, what they're thinking is that I have no impact or influence on my spouse. It's like almost a dismissal of the impact that I can have on my spouse. And the truth, I think, is a little bit more sophisticated. Like, in other words, you have people that are thinking, I want to change my spouse and I'm going to persuade them and I'm going to convince them. And here's how I'm going to get them to change. And all of their energy is directed. And then you have like their friends or their counselor or something come to them and say, no, Forget about them. You can't change them. You can only change yourself. And generally, people like flip back and forth between these two modes. And I think they're both uh, sort of not as, as sophisticated an understanding of how it really works in relationships. The way it really works is, yes, of course, I can only change me. I can't change my wife. However, it's important to recognize the influence that I have on my wife. My change, we, we can't be dismissive of the impact that my change has on my wife. Totally. A marriage is a system. Um, it, it, we, 
we, uh, my wife isn't just who she is. She also is who I am. In other words, when you're in a relationship, if I smile right now to you, you're much more likely to smile back at me. Yeah. If, I, if I give you a look, you know, your energy is going to change. Totally. You're going to, you know, and try it, try it with friends, try it with a stranger on the street. You know, yeah. we don't appreciate generally the impact that we have on our whole family culture. You know, it used to be a hundred years ago, nobody would ever walk outside in shorts. Why not? Because nobody did it. Today, we would have no problem walking outside in shorts because it's the culture. So there is a culture in our home. The difference is out in the world, I can't impact the fashion norms and mores of our society because I'm only one person and I'm not a fashion designer. But in my home, I'm the patriarch. And there's only one other, you know, the matriarch. So the impact, the cultural impact I can have is unbelievable. I'll give you a quick personal example. We at home live by the, the mantra. And we, we repeat it all the time. I repeat it to them. They repeat it to each other. Always speak in a calm voice. Always speak in a calm voice voice over and over again we teach it we tell stories about it we demonstrate it it's a value and it goes not just it's obvious that when you're angry you shouldn't scream or yell but i'm not talking about this that if it's time for dinner we don't scream dinner time it's not dignified if somebody's upstairs and you want to call them to dinner knock on their door and say it's time for dinner won't you join us you know and so that's the culture. And so, so what's my point? How do I tie this back in? Because in, in our home, when, when we make a mistake and somebody raises their voice, it's as if they stepped outside in shorts a hundred years ago. It's like that, that doesn't belong here. Mm. That's odd here. That doesn't fit in here. And they wouldn't feel comfortable behaving that way. And, and they shouldn't. And the day, by the way, is sometimes me. Could be me, could be my wife, could be my, one of my five kids. You know, it's just not how we do things here. So too in a marriage, when we become a certain kind of person, we contribute significantly to the marital culture. And we basically tell our wife or our husband, we tell them through our behavior, through our actions, that this is how we behave here. This is, these are the norms. These are the mores. This is what sort of the expectation is. Yeah. Most people don't appreciate the impact that, that, our, that our behavior has on the marital culture and whether or not a person feels comfortable behaving in the marriage in a certain way. So, you know, usually if we're being criticized and we don't like them and we don't want them to criticize or they're screaming and we don't, they're doing it because we've allowed a marital culture to blossom such that they feel comfortable behaving that way in the marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, man. Hey, I like that you, you've apparently thought this out. <laughs> You're not new to this field, buddy. This is great. I like this a lot, man. Um, have you always spoken in such a calm voice? Have you always been no. even healed that way? No. How, how, okay, so how did you get that way? How did just one day, big decision, that's it? Or how, how did you train? Because I'm fascinated by this because I'm definitely more, I'm a much more emotional person. My tone, like, you know, my wife is Russian. And I remember early on, she, her mom would be here and speaks no English. And I'd be telling Tatiana something passionately. And she's like, my mom thinks you're yelling at me. I'm like, no, I'm just really passionate about this. But her mom took it as I was yelling at her. So I get the benefits of calm voice. I really would like us to improve in that area as a family. Yeah, don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with passion. Yeah. Nothing wrong with energy. We have lots of passion and lots of energy. When I say speak in a calm voice, I'm speaking about the, the opposite would be the ugly, angry, frustrated, right. high volume voice that you know, we sometimes you know, remind each other and share with our kids, pardon the language, but you know, when, when, when a person speaks not in a calm voice, it's kind of like pooping on the living room floor. Yeah. Like it's just a real stench, not yeah. physically, but emotionally and spiritually. 
yeah. just a real stench in the house. Yeah. Anyway, to answer your question, um, how did I, so no, no personal, no authentic, real personal transformation happens overnight. Mm-hmm. Not a switch. The inspiration can happen overnight. The inspiration can be like a switch. But the real work of character development uh, takes time. Yeah. You know, takes energy. So um, I, I, I don't know how to answer the question concisely. I consider it a lifelong journey. Good. Well, it's great. I no, I appreciate. I appreciate your tone and tempo. I, I do, um, and that's something that I'd like to work on a bit in my life. Um, let me ask you a question. Hopefully, you don't get asked a bunch. Which is, what, how do you stay sharp now as a counselor, and how do you keep everything fresh? Because you've been studying this for a long time. You work with a lot of people. How are you continuing to grow? Uh, sorry, I just labeled you, which is probably not the appropriate label. But as a marriage expert, how do you continue to stay fresh in that field? How do you challenge your Yourself? Where are you going for information and learning? And what's that look like? That's a great question. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and the, for sure the most important thing, is my relationship with my wife. Mm. It's to practice what I preach. I consider myself, or I try to be like a live wire. I, I feel, I really deeply believe that I can't give you something that I don't have. And so I have to prioritize my wife and my marriage and work on being a great husband day in and day out because my greatest, my greatest teaching is my example. And even though like on this podcast, you know, I'm just delivering words and in theory, you know, the words could be truncated from the reality of my life in theory, but in practice, I believe that there is a, an energy that emanates from every one of us that really speaks to who we are, that, that people can feel. They yeah. pick it up, they sense it. Um, and I, you know, the, the, the constant feedback that I get from people in the program is that um, you know, they, they, they really resonate with my personal experience and example. Um, and that's part of what they're you know, really appreciating about my guidance and my leadership. And so, so the first thing is that I just you know, remind myself every day that uh, I have to be uh, a live wire. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's number one. And then number two is um, I try to do something that people are doing less and less and less of. Uh, it gets more and more challenging, and that is read. Mm-hmm. Um, access to real, and you know, most of the reading people today do their headlines and just, I mean, I was commenting to somebody that, you know, you can't even go to like what is in theory a news site like Fox News or Yahoo.com and just like consume real news for five minutes just to be a knowledgeable person about what's going on in the world right. without being bombarded with all of these inappropriate images and all this trashy, stupid stuff that they want to call news. I mean, I was looking at Yahoo.com the other day and half the stories, literally half, or either about sports or entertainment or something just stupid, you know? And um, anyway, I got a little distracted there, but what I was, sorry, I, what, what, I, what I mean to say is that I try- You're passionate, Mort, you're getting yeah, passionate. <laughs> I try to spend time reading something real, yeah. something deep, like the real wisdom literature of the ages. Um, Can you give us an example of what, some, you know, what, what have you been reading lately? Um, so I'm constantly reading, uh, uh, Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people, mm. which is a, you know, just a phenomenal book. Um, you know, over the years I've read Plato, I've read Kierkegaard. I read a lot of Jonathan Sachs writings who references a lot of the great thinkers of, you know, of the ages. Um, I'm constantly reading scripture, um, uh, I, I listen to podcasts, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, I just try to fill my mind and my heart and my soul with with good information, useful information, inspiring information, clean information. Yeah. And uh, the more I do that, it more the more it keeps me, you know, directed, focused on my values and my mission. 
Do you have a go-to podcast? One that you listen to more than others? Um, I have a whole bunch of them. Uh, front row dads. <laughs> I, I have since, since, since you talked to me, I listened to a couple front row dads and I like it. It's yeah. awesome, man. Great. Is your teaching faith-based? Interesting question. Um, no. Uh, but you're a man I, of faith, I, I'm guessing. Exactly. That's why it's an interesting question. I I intentionally designed marriage fitness as a non-faith-based marriage program because I wanted to reach everybody. I didn't want to pigeonhole my teachings in that way, and I didn't want to exclude people that weren't God or faith-oriented. Yeah. And so, um, so generally the feedback I get from people of faith is that they didn't realize that the program was so faith oriented because they could kind of feel the biblical principles emanating through my teachings. Uh, but the feedback I get from people that are not faith oriented is, well, no feedback about it because I never mention, I rarely mention God or scripture or anything like that. I, I just, I just speak about it in a non faith oriented language. Yep. Um, and uh, that was, that was all by design. And um, yes, I personally am a person of faith. Um, but I don't bring that so much into my work unless really requested. How many of your decisions are you making based on your own personal intuition or how many have been, uh, you know, principles that have been uh, given to you by God, let's say, uh, or is that the same thing? Um, Look, uh, so now you're really, it's a good question. You're really, you're really forcing me to, uh, and it's okay. You're really forcing me to go into the, you know, the, the faith. Yeah, less requested, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, there, I mentioned earlier that social contract does not determine the truth. Yeah. So it begs the question, so then what does determine the truth? Mm -hmm. Like, if we all agree that something is true, it doesn't mean that it is. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we could all agree that we don't believe in gravity. We could start a website, get millions of followers, make great posters, and all march to the, the edge of the Grand Canyon and, and in protest of gravity jump. And what's going to happen? We're all going to die, you know, because it really doesn't matter what we think. We don't get to determine the truth. The truth is the truth. Now, our job is to try to understand it and to align our life with it. The better we understand it, the better we align our life with it, the more peace and harmony and success we have. The more we either deny it or try to ignore it or claim that there is some other reality and try to live according to those things, then the more we're frustrated and suffer and have you know, negative consequences. So from a faith perspective, you know, we believe that, that God is the source of that truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for playing along. I told I, you know, I, I said I'm not going to ask you the softball questions everybody else asks you. So I hope I'm delivering on that promise. <laughs> you are. I love it. I love it. That's cool. What's your What's your big vision for this work? You know, if you fast forward and you're on your deathbed, looking back at your life, and you've achieved what you set out to achieve, how will you know that you'll have been successful? What will that look like or feel like to you? What will have, what type of letters will you have received? What type of, you know, is there numbers attached to that? Is there, how, how will you know? Is there a metric? Yeah, there probably should be. I mentioned that I went to the Wharton School of Business, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> you're asking a real business oriented question. It's a great question. But the truth is that you know, the work I'm doing is really coming from a very personal place. It's really coming from a very mission oriented place. I mean, yes, it's true. I, I have to make money and I have to support my family and I do make money and I do support my family, but it's not, you know, I'm not driven by metrics and numbers and I just don't run my, I, I just don't run my work in my life like that. Yeah. Um, you know, how will I know if I'm successful? Uh, I'll leave that for everybody else to decide. I just try to do the best I can every day. Yeah. Um, my mantra or my mission is to be useful. Um, I don't think we're here to just consume the pleasures of life. I think we're here to contribute, to serve, to be useful to others. And um, I ask myself every day, you know, and every moment of every day, am I doing what will make me useful to others? Before I accepted this invitation to come on this podcast, you know, 
I checked out John and what is he doing and who is his audience and am I going to be useful? You know, do I, do I think I'm going to make a difference in this hour? Um, and uh, of course I determined that I would and you're doing great work. So here I am. No, thanks, man. But that's the, uh, you know, I, I, it's not about metrics. Um, yeah. You know, everybody else can decide whether or not I'm succeeding. I just try to do the best I can every day. My friend Chris Hunt um, has a mantra every day, which is use me and amaze me. And uh, he's very faith-based in his life. And that's just, he, he, use me and amaze me somehow, some way, right? Like put me to work today. And he's, he's a servant leader at the, in the highest level, which is really cool. Love having him around in the front row family. Um, I, I, let, let's go. All right. So I divert, I went, I went on a few tangents, but I just want to keep this, you know, I want to keep this interesting for everybody, including you and me and all the listeners. But let's, let's get to a question that I've debated. Um, and I'd be shocked if this was a common question, but maybe it is. I've really been wrestling with how much, um, how much, I, I don't know what words to use, arguing, pain, um, trouble, like um, uh, how much bad stuff <laughs> in a home or in a marriage, in a marriage is okay because it's just normal life it's like, hey, things are just things can be bad. No marriage is perfect. You hear this all the time, right? No marriage is perfect. People argue, people fight, people make up. And that's actually good because if you're, I've even heard people say, like, I grew up in a home where my parents never fought. You know, like, and then and then all of a sudden I turned 18 and they got divorced. And I was like, what happened? Like it was like they weren't even being real with me, right? Or or that I never learned how to forgive because nobody ever fought and forgave in front of me. I've heard these arguments, right? Even like if you take it to a, a, a health point of view, if a kid's never exposed to bacteria, right, then he can't strengthen his immune system. So eat a little dirt. And so when my, when my wife and I argue or I fly off the handle or I say something stupid or I'm just acting like an idiot as a dad, which happens probably more often than I'd like, and, and I feel like I'm really working hard on myself. I feel like I'm a pretty grounded person. I'm a pretty good, good dude, like at my heart, right? But I still make mistakes. I still say and do dumb things. And I look back and go, oh man, like, did I just ruin my kid's life? And I question in our marriage, how much of our fighting is a normal amount of fighting for a couple to have? Or are we just really out of whack? Like, are, are we at the point where we're like, this is unhealthy. We're arguing way too much. Right? I don't even, is, I don't I don't even know if you can answer that question because you might say, I don't know what it's like to be in there. I don't know how much you're fighting. I don't, I don't know the answer, but it's, it's a genuine struggle. It's a question that I look at and ask, is our level of arguing or pain or where we don't communicate well normal and okay for our kids? Yeah, so, so let's just let's start, if you don't mind, by sort of analyzing your question. Yeah. Um, because your question is a relative one. In other words, the way you're asking it is, is the level of arguing in our home normal? So normal is a function of everybody else. Right? Yeah, if, if normally half the population is getting divorced, it's probably not a good metric anyway. Exactly. That was <laughs> part of my point is I, I, think, I think it would be helpful. I mean, I, I, know, I know what you're getting at. Yeah. But there's just an element to your question, which is the relativity that I think we could put aside and it would be, a, it would be just as good, if not a better question. Yes, let's, let's make it a better question, Mort. What's a healthy level of disagreement in a home? Yeah, so I think, so putting the relative piece aside, like in other words, who cares what's happening in everybody else's home? Uh, what we care about is what's happening in your home. And, um, and I would say two simple things. Number one is nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Every relationship has stress and conflict. Um, in a sense, the closer you are to somebody, the more likely you are to step on their toes. Yep. And that's why conflict and argument is, is common in, you know, in close, good relationships. You mentioned your friend who said, you know, my, my parents never argued. I never saw them argue. Well, that's a real red flag for me when I'm speaking to somebody and they tell me, you know, I, I don't know what happened. Like, you know, he, she just decided they were done. Doesn't make sense to me. We never argued for 20 years. And right. They're interpreting that very differently than I do. My interpretation of that is you never argued for 20 years. That, that's why you're getting divorced. Yeah. Uh, there's a bigger story there as to exactly to connect all those dots, but let's not go there for right now. But anyway, the point is that 
you know, conflict uh, argument, um, it's normal. Uh, it's going to happen. There is going to be an element of it. And that's an important thing to appreciate and realize because if you have these expectations that your relationship is going to be always like it was on your first date, <laughs> right? so those expectations are going to destroy your marriage because it's just completely unrealistic. Right. Um, so that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, no matter how much uh, argument or conflict we have, and no matter how normal or unavoidable it might be, we always want to be introspective. Mm -hmm. We always want to be looking at whatever negativity might exist in our relationship and asking ourselves, what's my part in this? How am I responsible here? What could I do to improve our relationship and myself so that we have less argument and less conflict and my wife feels more taken care of? Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, it's canny, right? You're probably familiar with canny, constant and never ending improvement. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, and you, and you, you're never going to get there. You never get to a place in a good marriage where there's no conflict and no argument. Um, but you always want to look at the conflict and argument that does exist, even though it might be somewhat normal and find out, you know, what's my contribution to this and how can there be less? Yeah. Do you have any advice for a couple where one of them wants to go to counseling and the other one doesn't? And whether it's man or woman on either side, but one of them totally buys in and the other one's like, that's a waste of money and time. Well, who am I giving the advice to? The one who wants the counseling or the one who doesn't? <laughs> well, either could be listening. So why don't you give advice to either side? Yeah. Uh. So first of all, to the, to the couple, I would say, and I do say this to couples, uh, sometimes people come to me premaritally. Uh, my son actually got married just a year ago. Oh, cool. And before he got married, I sat down with him and his fiance uh, and a few sessions with them uh, and discussed some sort of fundamental, you know, principles that I thought could help them. And one of the things that I facilitated between the two of them was a discussion about how if either of you ever request of the other that you go see a professional for the benefit of your family, that I, I, I want you to agree here and now. I'd, I'd like you to consider agreeing here and now that you are, you, you, you are ready to go. There, there's no such thing as saying no to that. You, you, you have to. You, you have to agree. And, of course, my son had heard this for many, many years. Uh, so he was, you know, on board. Uh, and she was on board, too. You know, they agreed. Okay, if any time in the future either of us ever request, the other will comply. Uh, I want you to know that if she had, had hesitated or disagreed with that, I would have encouraged him to call off the wedding. Mm. Not that he ever would have, not that she, I mean, I had no doubt that she would agree. She's an amazing woman. But, um, but I say to couples that are in the process of getting married, ask that question to your fiance. Get a commitment now that if you ever need, want to speak to somebody in the future, that they will go. And if they hesitate or don't agree, run. Don't talk, run. Because it's a sign of arrogance. Yeah. And arrogance destroys relationships. And for those who've already said yes? <laughs> so those that said yes, I'll go to counseling? No, meaning like oh, they said those yes, who've already said I do. <laughs> dealing, they said I do, and now they're dealing with a spouse who won't go. Yeah, yeah. So what would be my advice to them? It goes back to the whole discussion we had about the culture in a marriage and the, and, and the change that we can make that, that will influence their change and influence that culture. Mm -hmm. You can't force somebody to go. Um, it, unfortunately, it, it, it would be a sign that you're dealing with somebody who is arrogant. You're dealing with somebody who is not open to wisdom and information. You're dealing with somebody who's scared to change or who doesn't want to change. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. Yeah. Um, but your advice would be, I'm guessing, you go. Like if, if your partner won't go, then at least you go. Absolutely. 100%. For the yeah. reasons we discussed before, you want to try to, and this, by the way, I have in the Marriage Fitness Tele Boot Camp, I have a duo track for couples that do it together and a Lone Ranger track for exactly what you're describing. Yeah. 
a lone ranger track for people who are dealing with an obstinate spouse that refuses to go. And there we teach principles and practices that you can employ unilaterally without your spouse's cooperation that will influence them and your marriage. Yep. And so um, what you want your spouse to go to counseling because you want certain change to occur in your marriage and you're thinking you need your spouse in order for that change to occur. Now it's true, it would be better if your spouse were on board, the change would be more likely to happen and happen faster, but we don't appreciate the impact that we can have on our marriage through our own unilateral efforts. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and that's what I would say to the person who's dealing with that obstinate spouse is forget trying to convince them to go do what you can do to influence the marital culture and change the marriage. And there's probably a lot more than you can do than you realize. Yeah. Mort, do you have a, fa a favorite success story? Do you have a, a story you'd love to tell more than any other of, of a couple that you helped and how you got them through and what they did and decisions they made? I, I love stories. I'm just even in all these years, you've got to have a ton of success stories, ones that you're very, very proud of. I have a ton, thank God. Um, I'm proud of every single one. That's, they, they keep me going. They always bring a smile to my face. My staff and I share them around and they, they remind us of why we do what we do. Totally. Um, can I share one? Uh, and there, and there, are, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds on my website. Um, and I'm particularly thankful to those, you know, this is, to go through this kind of thing is, 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 is embarrassing. Uh, so most people that provide the testimonials, you know, are, they're, they're writing to me personally, but they're not so anxious about like putting their name, totally. in, you know, but yeah. well, thank God a lot of them have. And that's, uh, I really, I really appreciate, I really appreciate. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm not, I don't have such a good memory for these things. How about uh, this? I'll give, you a, I'll give you an alternative here. Yeah. How about a win in your marriage? And I don't know how openly you talk about, you, I think you mentioned that you actually, you know, perhaps use your own personal life as a guide where, yeah. where you're learning and growing. Do you talk about your personal challenges openly with groups and on air? I, I, we didn't talk about this beforehand, so feel free to pass on this. Yeah, I, I do. But before I get to that, what, when you were asking me that, a, a particular example did just pop into my head. So yeah. Share. All right. Well, feel free to share uh, both. Yeah, I'll, I'll share both. So, um, yeah, there's a couple. Um, uh, who uh, is in Atlanta and a um, uh, very successful couple. You know, he was having an affair and I um, can't remember, I'm trying to remember if he had moved out or he was planning to move out. And um, he had filed for divorce. They were in the midst of the divorce process. And if you asked him, they were done. Done. I mean, there's nothing to talk about here. Right? We're, we're beyond help, we're beyond Mort, you know, and there's, if I'm not mistaken, three little kids. And, um, and even though there have been terrible mistakes in the marriage, as I said, infidelity and just terrible, terrible mistakes, these are not evil people, you know. I mean, that's true in 99% of, you know, broken marriages. Nobody's evil. They're just uh, lost. So anyway, um, I went down to Atlanta to do a full day intensive with them. And um, uh, she had already done the program in the Lone Ranger track prior to me getting there. Um, and that had already, you know, moved the momentum a little bit that had already shifted things and got him open to meeting me uh, and the possibility of healing. And, um, the intensive was very, very successful. Um, by the end of the day, he had uh, severed the affair and um, has since had zero contact with his ex-mistress. Um, they uh, go on these romantic retreats every quarter now, just the two of them leaving the kids behind and regularly talk about how the marriage is not only healed from its pain, but healthier and better and more fulfilling than they had ever actually experienced, even in what they considered to be the good days. And they really healed from the hurt and got past the past and, you know, have moved forward. And um, 
you know, are being great parents and great to each other. They spend time together. They support each other. You know, they have fun together. And um, yeah, so that's the story. That's awesome. And congrats to you and to them you know, uh, for, for the work that they put in to get that done. Uh, cause forgiveness is huge. Uh, people often ask me if there was one word that creates a successful marriage, what would it be? And I'm like, I, I, I almost believe the word is forgiveness. Like that's the number yeah. one word, not even love anymore. Like I believe you got married cause you're in love. I believe you love that person. It's almost like that's there. Uh, it's, I guess it's possible to fall out of love, but but what really keeps it going is the ability to forgive, to forgive yourself for mistakes that you made, to be able to give your, forgive your partner for the mistakes they've made and yeah. to be able to just, uh, f- just be forgiving and even forgetful. Like, let's just forget about that. Let's move on. Let's go. Right. Really, we, we're not forgetting about it per se. We're just choosing not to focus on it as much. hundred yeah. percent. A person, you can't succeed in a, in a marriage long term if you can't forgive because people yeah. will make mistakes. Yeah. And if your expectation is that they won't, if you're so, and there are people like this, you know, yeah. like they're so exacting in their expectations of how other people behave that nobody could ever meet those expectations. They'll right. never be happy long-term in the relationship. Right. In order for them to feel fulfilled in a relationship, they basically have to hop from relationship to relationship because it's only the newness of a relationship that meets their expectations. But then they end up having a whole series of relationship roadkill and you know not really building a life and a legacy with any one person yeah yeah how about your own personal story what what about a challenge that you yeah, so, you've so i got i got this is all coming as you might be able to tell <laughs> this is all coming from a very personal place yeah you know that's how i got into this um my wife and i had our own marital crisis um you know many years ago it, the impetus which is not so relevant but i'll just mention it um, the impetus, uh, we, we um, had a son who died. Mm, um, so sorry to hear that, man. And about 18 months later, we had twin daughters who also died. Oh, my gosh. So in a very short period of time, we lost three, uh, three children. It was oh, a very, man. very difficult time. And it, it really threw our marriage into a crisis. Devastating. And we, um, we reached out for help in all the typical ways. You know, my wife learned about Mars and I learned about Venus. And we went to a therapist and... We were so horrified at the, at the type of help and the, and the competency of people that were helping. Um, and we really found that what the direction we were getting was making things worse, not better, because everybody was asking about what was wrong and we were just rehashing the problems and taking the argument from the kitchen table into their office. And the whole thing was just so unhealthy and dysfunctional. Um, and we were just mired in all the negativity of the situation. And in retrospect, we realized that we didn't really start making any progress until we started to temporarily put those issues, the problems and all that negativity aside and just started to to build goodwill through healthy, positive relationship habits. So in other words, instead of fixing what was wrong, we just started to make new things right. And what I just did... What I just, I could have never articulated that back when we were doing it. But what I just did was I just articulated the core methodology of marriage fitness and why it's so distinct from marriage counseling and marriage therapy. So coming out of this experience, we felt like we had, a, we had discovered something that we had a responsibility to share with the world. And I, I spent about nine months writing marriage fitness. I really thought I would, you know, bind a few copies, give them to my kids, and then move on to like something else. Um, but I sent the manuscript around and it, you know, got started to get the attention of some big name people in the media. And that was really the start of me doing of the work that I do. It's very cool. You know, I, I really like this conversation about the positive, healthy habits, adding them in, because sometimes I feel like I'm just avoiding stuff when it's like, there's a problem and I'm like, I'm just going to do this thing that is working over here. And maybe does that mean I'm just being weak and I'm, I'm avoiding it. But I, I do believe there's a big difference between, hey, let's choose to focus on what's right. In the front row factor book that I wrote, I, I wrote, amplify the good so you can silence what's not. Because sometimes, you know, you, you do need to do that. That's, a, that's, that's the way out is to say, all right, what's right here? I mean, one of my best friends in the world, John Berghoff, is the lead facilitator really in the world for appreciative inquiry, which is a whole process for the last 30 years that focuses on, uh, it's a strength-based system. What's working here? How can we do more of that? How can we make 
the strength so powerful that the weaknesses become irrelevant. I think that's actually a Peter Drucker quote. But, um, you know, so I, I like that. One of my questions that I want to ask you here more, this will be my final question, and then you can say anything you want. We'll give you the final word. But my, my last question is that in our groups, like in our retreats for Front Row Dads and in our small groups that we have for the men and in our conversations with other men, my, my question is how much venting is healthy, how much talking about what's wrong is healthy versus the percentage of how much do we need to be focusing on what's right? Because I can tell you personally that there have been times when I needed to get something off my chest. I needed to talk about what was broken. I needed to talk about the pain. I needed to voice it to get it out, to even just articulate how I even felt by saying the words out loud. Right. Sometimes talking it out helped me figure out what I was actually feeling or what was going on. Yeah. Um, and it gave people a little context. So, but I don't think guys should sit around and bitch about their problems or bitch about their wives or, hey, my life would be great if my wife was better or whatever. Right. I don't think, hey, you blame it on, stop blaming it on your kids, stop blaming it on your wife. Right. Take some responsibility. But I think it is okay. My take on it is this, and you tell me, my take is it's okay to vent, it's okay to share the problem but you've got to move quickly into what are the solutions and what can you do and what are you in control of? And maybe if there was even a percentage of a conversation, I would say 10% needs to be on venting and 90% on the solution if I was to actually try to give it a, and I realize that's not the case, or even if you're having a series of 10 conversations, let conversation one be about the venting and then every other conversation be about what you're going to do. But there has to be a limit to it, I think. What's your take? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's a simple formula that we can apply to this. I think it's a judgment call. Um, I'll mention a couple of things that I think one should consider in trying to make the judgment. So first of all is who are we venting to? Um, that requires some wisdom. Like, am I venting to my friend? Am I venting to a professional? Am I venting to my wife? Like, who am I venting to? Um, venting to my wife, if that venting is so unfiltered that it's just laced with all of this negative, it could be very destructive. I, I might be better off refraining from that kind of venting or venting that kind to her. Mm -hmm. Also, let me say that this gives me an opportunity to bring up an important principle I think, and this is terribly violated in today's world, um, and is you know the opposite of this has become part of the norm and part of our culture. But I think one of the most important qualities in a marriage is the quality of privacy. We spoke a little bit earlier about the relationship between exclusivity and intimacy. It's related to that idea, privacy. And I think we're responsible for a lot of our relationship being completely private between us. It's not appropriate, in my opinion, to speak to anybody about our spouse or our marriage, other than a professional. Uh, it's a violation of my spouse's privacy. Uh, I can't speak to you about my marriage without speaking to you about my wife's marriage because it's the same marriage. And who said that I have permission from her to do that? It could very well interfere with her relationship with you because it's gonna impact how you view her. Um, and there's another reason also, which I won't go into right now, but so there's a few reasons why I don't think, I think we should be working very hard to protect the privacy in our marriage. Of course, we can spe always speak to a professional um, you know, about it, that's different. But friends and family, to be speaking to them about our spouse or our marriage, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's wise. So my point is that the first question is, you know, and this requires real judgment, is who are we venting to? And then the second thing is, when we're venting, you know, how are we doing that? If it's this completely unfiltered rant, it's pretty rare that that's productive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's probably wiser to be more deliberate with what are we thinking? What are we feeling? What are we trying to accomplish by articulating it? And how can we articulate it in a way that is therapeutic for us maybe, but also productive for the relationship? Yep. Um, you know, uh, words have a lot of power. 
a, a lot of power. And we need to be really, really careful with them. Um, in, in so many cases in a marriage, we're much better off not saying what we're thinking. Yeah. Or at least saying it tomorrow. Yeah. By the time yeah. tomorrow comes, I might not feel the need to say it anymore. Or maybe I'll say it with a little bit more mm. intelligence, more wisdom, more ju better judgment. You just hit me that I, I've never had this thought, but I just had it now for the first time of in my life, the most, the thing that's hurt me the most has been words more than anything else, more than any, more than anything on the planet. The thing that's hurt me the worst in my life has been words. Yeah. I, I don't think you're alone, alone in that. I think it's yeah. a most experience. You know, I'll share with you a great myth. It's a common myth. Everybody knows it, but people just don't know it as a myth. They know, they think, and you hear people say it all the time. If I can't tell you what I think, then there's something wrong with our relationship. Yep. And basically that's a way for people to say, I want to say what I want to say, how I want to say it, when I want to say it, and I don't want to have to think. And that's not a good relationship. That's stupidity. It's absolute stupidity. A smart person in a good, healthy relationship is deliberate about what they say, when they say it, and how they say it, because they realize that, that words are powerful. Another myth, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you, hurt me, right? We, we learned that in elementary school. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lie. It's a lie. Words are incredibly hurtful. Right. <laughs> They're incredibly destructive, and we have to be very careful with them. Yeah. Yeah. King David said, silence is offense to wisdom. Mm. Hmm. Well, more. this has been awesome. I wish we had another hour, but maybe we can at some point. Maybe we can. Okay. Uh, hey, I know we're out of time. I do want to give you a chance to wrap this up. So final words to you. Anything you want to say to the guys, any call to action, any summary, any whatever. Uh, and also please include in that, where can they find more of you? Sure. So in terms of where you can find more of me, you can go to my website, mortfertel.com. I actually have a special page for Front Row Dads listeners, mortfertel.com slash Front Row Dads. Uh, and you can get my free report there, Seven Secrets to Fixing Your Marriage. It's totally free. There's lots of other free information also. And if you're interested in learning more about the services that I provide, as well as the Marriage Fitness Tele Bootcamp, of course, you can get information there. And in terms of what I'd like to say, just that, you know, like I said, I, I checked, checked you out before I uh, agreed to come on. And I so admire, um, I mean, I'll address your audience because I already said this to you, but I admire you, that being you, the listener, the audience, I admire all of you for being part of this community and for putting your, your marriage and your family and your fatherhood first. I was just so moved by that, that there's a whole group of people and a whole community that sees the, the, the value in that and, and, the, um, and the priority in their life being uh, that, that, that you know, they should be a front row dad. You know, I, when I do these full day intensives, I don't usually do them in Baltimore. I usually fly to wherever, you know, I'm going to this couple that's in crisis. And, um, you know, to be frank, it's not cheap. Uh, to have me for a day. Uh, and um, so I walk into these, these houses, they're, they're astonishing. I mean, the houses are just astonishing, but there's no home. Mm -hmm. And it's the saddest thing in the world, you know? And you all are focused on not only building a beautiful house, but having a beautiful home. Mm -hmm. And I, I commend you for that, that's, that's, that's right on. Wow. Mort, I got to tell you, man, this is one of my favorite interviews uh, that I've done on this podcast since it started. And I really mean that, man. This has been really, this exceeded my expectations. And I, I didn't come in with a lot, actually. I came in wanting to learn about you and your world and, uh, and, and really just free flow. I like sometimes not knowing a ton about my guests because it puts me in the mindset of a listener. I really enjoy that. I'm kind of learning with our listeners. Um, I knew enough about you to know you're a badass before you got on here. But uh, you know, this is just really an outstanding conversation. There was so much wisdom in here. And I think you couldn't have ended it with a better thought about the house can be astonishing but it can be missing the home. You know, it's not a home. And I love that concept. Like, I don't want an astonishing house. Uh, I, want a, I want a home that allows people to thrive. 
And uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. You gave me a new lens and a new perspective uh, that I didn't have before this hour started. So thank you, my friend. Uh, I hope everybody goes and checks out your work and uh, we'll link everything also to, to the page that you created. We'll link that over, over at Front Row Dads where we'll host the show. And more. thank you again for being with us and I look forward to building our friendship in the years ahead.